Thanks for coming today, or actually watching. And today what I'd like to do is quickly run through the presentation I gave at NACES 2014 in Pittsburgh. And partially I'm doing this for anyone who missed it who might actually, for some reason, be interested in what I spoke about. And also, uh, in another sense, I'm doing it basically for posterity's sake so that I remember what I spoke about when I'm old and senile. So my name's Ian Muhlenhaus. I'm at James Madison University. And basically what I, I'm... My current research is interested in taking theories of form, style, aesthetics, and meaning from other disciplines, particularly the humanities and literature and film studies, and adapting, basically attempting to adapt these to better study and analyze maps. And really my research stems from earlier work I did on persuasive map design. I study persuasive maps. I'm kind of known as the zany persuasive maps guy. It's this thing I'm trying to get over, actually, in the past. But I studied persuasive map design and was looking at aesthetics and different map styles that could be used to create different feelings in audiences that view the maps. And while doing this research, I realized that a lot of the things I was talking about, they really applied to all maps, not just pers over, you know, overtly persuasive ones. And so it got me thinking, how can I like all three of these maps, for example, on the screen right now? How come I like all three of these? They're totally different, yet I really respond to all three favorably, and aesthetically, I, I really enjoy them. So is there a way that we can start understanding why I like these three and what makes them each one powerful to me? The perceptual map on the left, the Canyonlands map on the top by the National Park Service, which is very you know, scientific in appearance, etc., and then the Excel map on the lower right-hand corner. There's been a lot of talk in recent years about aesthetics and mapping. Uh, George McCleary and Aileen Buckley and others have been talking about it at previous NASIS conferences, particularly in Portland. And um, one thing that's kind of confounded me about the, the, these discussions, are, besides the fact that they're enlightening, but one thing that's been frustrating is the fact that really we still haven't found good answers, and there's no way there's no way to answer the question, why do I like all three of these? What makes all three of these appealing to me? And so one of my goals is to try to more systematically understand map aesthetics, and I think perhaps we can do that by shifting how we analyze it. There's a problem with map aesthetics. When we talk about aesthetics and we borrow, borrow from fine, fine art, there's this problem, because we know that aesthetic will change depending on the map audience. So I've got this Hello Kitty map of the world that I bought for my daughter on, on her bedroom wall, and it's it's her favorite. She thinks it's the best map ever. And it, actually, I kind of like it too. I was notice I'm sneaking more and more pink on my maps now that I have a five-year-old daughter. But the point is, obviously, not everyone's going to think that this is the best map in the world. So aesthetic changes depending on audience, and that makes it very difficult to study and analyze. And then also, it changes over time. And so George McCleary gave a great talk several years ago at Anasis where he was discussing how the in-color and the in-typography changes constantly. And, and basically, you can analyze it decade by decade. There's a great book called Then Is Now, and I forget the name of the author. Actually, I shouldn't say it's a great book. It's actually a really mediocre book, but it gives pri prime examples throughout of how color choices, color palettes, and, and type have changed throughout time, and what's hip one year very well may not be the next. But that's a problem when you're talking about map aesthetics. How can we compare the aesthetics of the Hello Kitty map with the map on the right here that looks somewhat antique and, well, just kind of cluttered and overly saturated by today's standards? So one thing that I've been thinking a lot about is that maybe when we're talking about aesthetics, we're not looking in the right places. Maybe we're, we're thinking of maps as fine art because, I mean, in many cases, they, they are very beautiful. They are they're older. The more antique ones are often more ornate, etc. But really, if we think about them more as stories, which obviously is a huge buzz phrase right now, and I'm not trying to get into narrative maps and some story maps and what are story maps. And Esri, you can, you can trademark that phrase. That's fine. But maps tell stories. Images tell stories. Images basically emit feeling, and people create feelings and meanings from from any image they see. Now, some people would say, well, it can't tell a story unless it has a temporal element, and I say bollocks. Quite frankly, I don't think that's totally true. And I take this Family Circus cartoon here, which, yes, I despise Family Circus. I think that was a line that was quoted in the original talk, but the cartoon serves its purpose, and I really apologize if you too despise Family Circus. But... 
basically this this picture is telling a story it's telling the story of a child who's very frustrated with the fact that his 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 art form and his his favorite you know thing to look at is being commodified and there's no temporal aspect the thing is written in present tense yet there's a story here and there's a meaning that can be created from it it's the same with maps so maps aren't necessarily fine art if we're looking to talk about aesthetics and maps we need to start looking for form or how, how stories shape meanings so what I've been doing recently is I've been moving into looking at critical literature and film theory and I've been looking at Kenneth Burke and Thomas Schatz that's an unfortunate name but Basically, I've been reading a lot of literature on this to see if there aren't some things that we can borrow from these sources. Now, the idea to do this actually stemmed from a couple of things, but primarily it was from teaching. So I was teaching a geopolitics and film, a geopolitics and film course at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse, where I formerly taught, and I started reading film theory, you know, basically to teach students how to critique films, etc. And I started, as I was reading this film theory, I, I realized, wow, all this stuff they're talking about can really be applied pretty well to maps. I wonder if some of this is um, adaptable. And then as I started digging in, so basically from the, the cursory stuff, the basic, you know, introductory film studies books, and started looking at the literature underlying it, I realized a lot of it came from literature, the critical literature theory, all the way back to the 30s. And a lot of the concepts used to analyze films are really based on literature, the ultimate method of storytelling. Um, film, you could say film is the ultimate method of visual storytelling, perhaps. So I started reading all this literature and coming with these concepts and theories, that many of which were written, you know, 50 years ago. And I was thinking, these, can, these are totally applicable to maps. Um, they just need a little tweaking and a little, you know, cartographic upgrading, if you will. And so that's the gist of the rest of my talk is a couple of concepts that I've borrowed from the, these fields and that I think might start helping us better explain map aesthetics. So what are maps? Maps are stories and they're also, um, they're also methods of creating meanings. So too often I think in academic cartography we're so obsessed with data accuracy and detail and and this faux objectivity that you know has, has largely been espoused by uh, in, in information visualization for a couple decades now, you know, Tufties, no chart junk, etc. That um, we forget that basically maps are creating meanings. They're just like films in a lot of ways, in the sense that a film shapes people's realities. There's a real power there, and maps shape people's realities too. In a sense, one of the the biggest connections I see between film and maps is. Both, both involve an audience suspending its disbelief. So when you look at a map, you suspend the fa the you suspend your disbelief in it, and you start to believe it's representing reality. It's the same when you're viewing a good movie. You don't stop and go, go that's impossible. If it's a good movie, if it's a bad movie, you might actually do that while watching Iron Man, which is unfortunate because you know that's not what the filmmaker hopes you do. The filmmaker hopes you suspend your disbelief and become emotionally involved in it and get some meaning from it. It's the same with map design. A well-designed map, theoretically, map readers suspend their disbelief, they become emotionally enraptured, in, uh, enraptured I don't know, uh, ensnared in it, and then they start to create meanings from it. So um, the example, for example, the map on the left, yeah, I mean, the meaning officially is Japanese troop advances, but there are some other meanings in there. Film studies offers us um, a really neat way, and particularly from a pedagogical standpoint, to teach meaning in maps. And that's because in film studies, they kind of have these different levels of measurement, or excuse me, levels of meaning that are very similar to our levels of measurement. And there are four basic ones. And these four b basic levels of meaning are different ways you can analyze how, how and what a map is communicating to an audience. So the first is referential. Referential meaning in film studies would be this movie is about a young teen who is torn between two potential bows and then also has to go fight in some war game thing, Lord of the Flies style. That would be Hunger Games referential meaning. It misses the whole point of the plot, etc. I mean, there, it gives you the plot, it's a synopsis, 
but it really doesn't give you any in-depth meaning and, and it's very hard to make an emotional connection to it. The same can be said about maps. Maps have referential meaning. What is the map showing? What is the map about? What's the story here? And so for this map from the United States Census, it's about percentage of uninsured people in the past 12 months for the United States, 2012. And that's the referential meaning. That's all it's telling us. It's what the map's about. Piece of cake. There's also explicit meaning. Explicit meaning is not referential, but it's what the move, uh, what the, the map is actually saying. So what's it explicitly telling us? Not necessarily data-wise showing us, but what's it telling us? The example here, the news map uh, from World War II, it was sent to U.S. troops every week. On the news map, this map is referentially, it's about U.S. troop advancements, the state of the war in the Pacific, but explicitly it's saying Japan's toast. It's surrounded, it's getting choked off, it's in a sea of blood. So hooray, it's, it's basically saying, don't worry, we got this one in the bag to the U.S. troops. A third level of meaning is implicit meaning. Implicit meaning is a meaning that's implied, a meaning that you hope a map reader derive, that a map reader would derive from the map information. It's not ex referential, it's not explicitly stated, and often this is um, an aesthetic quality. So, for example, this is from the Atlas of Radical Cartography. It's an excerpt from a map of extradition flights the CIA has flown. I forget which year. It was all the rage when it came out in the mid-2000s, and it's a really cool map. Now, the map referentially is just showing extradition flights. Um, explicitly, it might be more difficult to figure out what it's saying, although I forget maybe the title is explicit. But implicitly, the color, the design, the topic, the kind of very authoritative appearance of it, it's implying that, hey, maybe this isn't cool. Maybe there's more, there are, there are more rendition flights going on than we realized, and holy cow, a lot of people are being stripped of their rights and flown around the world without anyone knowing about it. So it's, it's probably making some map readers a bit uncomfortable. And finally, the fourth level of meaning, and this is something that critical cartographers often hit on, and, and it's been talked about in cartography. So getting back to the academic cartographers often focus on referential meaning. So how can we make something as clear and objective as possible? Well, critical cartographers have been concerned with symptomatic meaning. And symptomatic meaning is basically every map is created for a reason. A reason something is mapped when it is, is a symptom. It's a symptom of something that's going on in society. There's a reason or a purpose or maybe not a purpose, unfortunately, but a reason that a map comes out when it did. And so symptom, symptomatic meaning is, what's the meaning of the map? Why did it come out as it did, when it did? And so this is a Twitter map, I think stolen from a CardoDB website or whatnot. And, you know, it's visually pretty cool, red circles, etc. And I believe it was showing uh, when an earthquake struck Japan, how many tweets, you know, were, were posted about it within whatever time frame. Tw tweets about an earthquake in Japan. Now, referentially, that's what this map's about, and it's showing us tweets. Uh, basically, it's not telling us anything. That's the irony of, you know, big data maps. Um, this map is a symptom, because what it's telling us is Europeans were awake when the earthquake went off, and, you know, the East Coast was starting to wake up. Brazil was awake as well. So the, the places that were awake happened to tweet about it. That's really fascinating information. And also, um, big cities tweet more than smaller cities. That's really all this is telling us. However, the symptomatic meaning is really interesting to me, and I, I think all of these Twitter maps that often don't illuminate much, you know, uh, you know, referential data, much information that's very insightful, but it's often very beautiful. I'd say this is a nice-looking map. It's symptomatic of the fact that we have big data and we can map it. We're mapping it because we can, and we don't even know what to do with this data, so we're just mapping everything quite willy-nilly most times, and because it's kind of cool and exciting. That's, that's the symptomatic meaning of this map. This map exists because we have Twitter and because it's now possible to map it very quickly. So, meaning. With those four levels of meaning broken down from film studies, um, I think we can better understand how film critics analyze films. For example, yes, the movie Jaws is about a shark that's on the loose eating people. But that's not really the full meaning, right? There are that the there are other meanings too. Explicit meaning: shark sharks are super dangerous, and hopefully there's an elusive one. Implicit meaning: you should be, um, you know, might want to be scared next time you go swimming in the ocean. By the way, I still am. I'm terrified of oceans. And then the symptomatic meaning: I don't know what the symptomatic meaning was. Basically, they could make big, big animatronic sharks at the time when the movie came out. So that that's the symptomatic meaning. The point is, film critics often 
critique films on how well you know they they create these different meanings. So the synopsis, the referential meaning, is actually the least important when it comes to great films. They often have many and layered implicit meanings. They might have explicit meanings that really hit home, and they also might have symptomatic meanings that really um, you know strike with an audience. And how all these combine and, and how these meanings are relate to an audience is part of what a film critic does is analyzing these things. So how do film directors as well as cartographers create meaning? And that's the main goal when we make maps. It's not to show information accurately or objectively. A map is a form of communication. The, the, potent, the point is to create meaning in a map audience and preferably meaning so they come back to the information or it sticks with them. Uh, the, you know, basically the message that you're trying to create. One of my favorite quotes ever, and I rarely say that because I've only had two favorite quotes ever, and this one displaced the last one, is Kenneth Burke's quote, form is the creation of an appetite in the mind of an auditor and the adequate satisfying of that appetite. And form, as we'll see, is the, a concept borrowed from literature and also film that really summarizes aesthetics. Aesthetic is often used when referring to fine art, etc. Form is used when telling stories. Form is um, the key, I argue, to understanding what makes certain maps sing to the soul and others not. But the key here is you not only have to create an appetite in those looking at a map, you have to satisfy it. So you can have a lot of really good looking information, <clears throat> like this one, but does this satisfy any curiosity for me? No, not really. So it's it's beautiful, but it's not going to it's not going to turn into a memorable user experience, and it might not be one that I return to very much after I'm done recording this. Um, so you need to satisfy that appetite. Another way of thinking about it is you need to create curiosity, and then fulfill that curiosity, and that's what makes something have good form. So what is form? Form is a system. It's 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 an entirety. It's how everything in your map ties together. Just like in a film, actually, form and film would be everything from the opening credits to the script to the actor's movements to the camera angles to the soundtrack to um, a bunch of special effects added to the closing credits. Everything, subtitles, everything tying together is a film's form. And form and, and map making would be all of these things. The trick is this. Form is not a sum of its parts. Form is how well all of these interact with one another. It's an entire system. So a map, um, all maps have form. All, basically all um, methods of communication have form. But good form comes when all of these parts interact with one another really well. One thing that I think we've been doing in cartography, and myself included when I teach cartography, and I now feel horrible for all my former students, is we often emphasize individual elements. So we might look at the title, how to design a good title, or labels, how to place the labels perfectly, or graphics, or you know, typefaces, etc., etc. And these things are really important to look at individually. However, oftentimes we create conventions for like how to lay out a legend, and Actually, that, that convention should be broken in a given situation because really we need to be talking more about how to tie all of these map elements together so they work well with each other in a given context, in a given mapping context. And when you do that, when you start work, uh, making sure that everything works well together to create meaning and try to create a message that you're trying to push across to an audience, that's when your map will have great form. That's when you'll get something like this. For example, you have a supplemental text box, and you have what Tufty would probably have a heart attack over. You know, these this this chart junk at the back, these illustrations that are just distracting. Well, good. People should be distracted. And actually, I would disagree. These aren't distracting because they tie in perfectly with the rest of the map. They follow the feel, same color tones. They fill in this empty white space. They're kind of romantic in the sense, no pun intended, uh, you know, that they, they look ancient. And basically, this whole map, this map's like awesome, and I keep looking at it because the form is excellent. The type is well chosen and well spaced, a good visual hierarchy. Everything works together. The legend is perfectly placed here. Um, you know, conventions about certain elements being together in a legend be damned. They've got some mimetic devices here. This map's form is epic. It's it's great. And that's what makes this map good, is how all these elements tie together. Not just the labeling, not just the color, you know, the color choices. And that's what map form is. 
Now, um, form also includes information. And this is important to remember. Um, so I, I think I was emphasizing map elements, etc. It also includes all the data, all the data model manipulations you've made, etc. And so all of these have to really work well together to achieve your message. And when they do, your map will have great form. It's not about these individual elements. Now, critical literature theory goes on to break form down into more specific I guess you could say subcategories. Wellick and Warren, who I think this is from the book called Theory of Literature, <laughs> which is pretty dense. Um, basically, they argue that there are two types of form. Form can be broken down into what's called outer form and inner form. Outer form is what is being presented in the story, or in you know because this comes from literature studies. In this case, in the map. So here in this map, what's being presented is a national park with shaded relief, cap camping amenities, elevation points, all this sort of stuff. And basically, this is what people see. This is the outer form. This is this is what people have to interpret. But there's also something that I think cartographers have been largely um, scared of talking about and something that I've talked about a lot when I talk about persuasive maps that I think actually, and I always have felt this way, applies to all maps, and it's called inner form. All maps, all forms of communication have a tone, they have goals, they have purposes, and basically inner form is what was the tone, the purpose, um, what, what was going into this map when it was designed. And you can tell the tone when you look at something. So yes, you have the outer form that, you know, the... Shenandoah National Park, um, you see the, the park boundaries, etc. But there was an inner form behind that, and the inner form behind that was objectivity, um, professionalism, etc. The inner form of this map, on the other hand, would be, I guess you could say, somewhat, um, somewhat propagandist, somewhat biased, quite frankly. This is a map that I absolutely love. It came out in Time Magazine in 2001. And they're basically saying Osama bin Laden is cornered. We're going to, you know, the U.S. is going to get him. Don't worry. They were quite wrong. So the tone of this map is very different from the tone of the Shenandoah Valley, uh, or not Valley, but National Park map. And so that's inner form, the tone, the attitude of the map. Now, how does this all tie together? Well, Kenneth Burke, I, I highly recommend reading his stuff. It's just mind-blowing, um, if not a little dense at times. He argues that basically all form has eloquence, or not. Let, let me rephrase that. Some, not all forms are created equal. Everything has form, but some forms are eloquent, and some forms are more eloquent than others. And really, what he's getting at when he call, calls something eloquence is he's talking about aesthetic. He's talking about when form really works. When, the, when something's form is done really well, it becomes eloquent and it has good aesthetic. And so um, this is one reason that I can love all three of these maps, though they're very different, and it should, um, yeah, though they're, ve they're very different. But eloquence is actually, um, when, when a map has, it becomes eloquent, when its form works really well, that's what makes it memorable and makes people come back and look at it again and again. So, for example, this noise complaints in Manhattan, one of the, my favorite maps I've seen in, in the past year. <clears throat> and at the same time, I really could give two hoots about noise complaints in Manhattan. In fact, I could give two hoots about Manhattan. And so I don't, I don't even know Manhattan that well other than like Times Square, ooh, yeah, the M&M store. But basically, I keep looking at this map, and it's not because of the information being presented. It's because of its form. It's stunning. There are no streets on it. I can still see the street lines. It's just really, really neat. And so what Kenneth Burke argues is that eloquence, form achieves eloquence when it minimizes an audience's interest in the fact. Now, at first, that sounds basically you know, anathema to everything cartographers stand for. I mean, data should stand on its own content over style, etc. Well, no, Kenneth Burke says there is no separating um, style from substance. They're the same. Style and substance are both part of form. What matters is how well a form melds together. And in fact, Kenneth Burke goes against everything that we've been taught so far when he argues that information in a, in a story is a one-trick pony. Information, people will view something once to get information. But in order for them to really love something and to come back to it, it has to have um, really good form, and basically it has to be eloquent. So if something has good form, the information isn't the reason people come back. The informa If something's eloquent, I should say. The, um, 
the style is the reason people come back. And when you think about this, that's very true. Even with um, documentaries, often they're considered, you know, normally people don't enjoy watching documentaries numerous times because generally you're taking information from it and you get the information. And why would you go back and watch it unless it's really powerful like Blackfish and you want to cry all the time, which, okay, I'm a sucker for that. But some documentaries like Blackfish are more powerful and they have really good form. And so maybe you will watch those many times. This Manhattan map, I'm not even getting any information from it because I don't even know what these places are, nor do I care. I am just keep looking at it, and I just find it uh, very attractive. The Heart, Heart of the Canyonlands National Park map. I've never been to the Canyonlands National Park, and I doubt I'll ever go, quite frankly, but it's so beautifully designed that I keep checking it out, and I love looking at it, and the labels and everything. And then, of course, you have Marty Elmer's um, awesome-looking map. And quite frankly, I don't care what the Democratic Republic of Congo's or Zaire's number one term on Wikipedia is. That's not why I keep looking at it. The information doesn't matter. It's about the form. It's eloquent and it's stylish. And that's why I keep looking at it. So how can we start analyzing this stuff? Well, Kenneth Burke argues that there's this kind of axis of eloquence. And so maps can be, not all, not all types of eloquence are the same. There are two extremes. There's what he calls mannered eloquence and styled eloquence. Mannered eloquence is uh, basically these are conventions that are followed to a T. And when the, um, so when the form is really pulled off well, um, it's still very eloquent, but it's mannered. So it follows certain conventions and predictable and established norms. For example, the national park map on the last page is mannered, elo it's mannered style, or excuse me, mannered eloquence. Its form is mannered. It's very predictable. It's very professional looking. The inner form's professional and objective. It, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very referential in meaning. Basically, it's not, you're not going to find many implicit meanings in there unless some of the place names have, uh, you know, Native American wars on them or something. So the benefits of using of mannered eloquence, designing a map that's eloquent but very conventional, is that it's really easy to interpret for an audience, and the referential meanings, what it's about, are generally very clear. So this is a very effective form type to use if you're trying to create a very clear map. Hence, Tufty just loves these maps. Really what Tufty loves is he loves mannered eloquence. He loves he loves map, really well-designed uh, uh, map forms that are that are mannered. The drawback, of course, is that they're often quite boring, and they start to look like they were, you know, drawn by robots or very minimalist, which, you know, can be aesthetically pleasing, but not exactly the most exciting thing. There's a danger that viewers are less likely to um, be emotionally affected or create meanings from them, and and that's a real drawback. Sometimes you want would like to create a map that where the people get can create meaning from. A U.S. topographic map is mannered. I wouldn't say it's eloquent, but it's definitely a mannered um, form. On the flip end, you have styled eloquence. Styled eloquence are maps, or this is again borrowed from literature and film studies, films or books, that don't follow convention. They break the norms. Uh, uh, an example, a prime example, would be the film Pulp Fiction. One reason it's more awesome if you're into gang movies than most gang movies is because it goes back and forth through time. Characters disappear at the start and show up again at the end. It's very unpredictable. It's very styled, and that's very powerful. Um, it makes you want to watch it again and again, at least a couple times until the violence starts to overwhelm. The benefits of using styled maps are pretty clear. For example, you've probably already looked at this African map more than you would have at a map made in GIS with each country labeled in the middle, right? So the style is what's drawing you in, not so much the information per se, but the style gets, gets map audience interest. It can also push the envelope for mannered maps, and often what ends up happening is something that's styled to begin with ends up becoming pretty mannered. There, it starts to become conventional, and we're starting to see that with typographic maps. Uh, the drawback, of course, is that my mother might not get this map. She might look at it and be like, huh, what is this? She might not even recognize the continent, quite frankly, but that's beyond the scope of this study. So lack of conventions can make your audience uncomfortable, and they'll often miss any meanings that you are trying to create for them. But styled maps are often better at uh, you know, getting implicit, implicit uh, meanings across to an audience. An example in film would be 2001. 2001 is probably one of the more extremely styled films I've ever seen. I still don't understand everything about it. Um, the monkey scene, I think I finally figured out at the start, 
but why it's there and in the same movie, I don't know. And at the end, I have no idea. So it's very complex. My wife won't even sit through the film with me. I've tried a couple times now. And at the same time, I, I think I'm creating meanings from it, but I'm not sure I'm getting it. So how can we tie all this together for some sort of map analysis? And this is something that I'm working on right now. So uh, I have a paper coming out in Cartographic Perspectives in a month or two, basically about uh, map form and map meaning. But the next step is this. And, and this is still very preliminary, but something I'm really excited about. Can we figure out a system or a technique for kind of placing films and, and, and evaluating or critiquing films based on their form? And does this help, help us get around the whole anecdotal nature of talking about aesthetic? If we start more systematically talking about map form and form eloquence, then we can start maybe comparing maps to one another and also starting start critiquing them based on how well they convey certain meanings given their their chosen you know form so this is a cube i designed and it's still very preliminary but basically what we have here on is inner form so all the way from objective to biased so the attitude remember inner form is attitude and tone of the map down here we have form eloquence from styled to mannered and down here we have outer form from simple to complex so this is how much information and, and how much graphic complexity there is being shown to a, a map reader. And my idea is this, that basically we can start maybe using Likert scales or something to place maps in this in this matrix or whatever you want to call it, the cube, right? And so, you know, a uh, National Geographic map that was pretty styled, that was objective, it was about people dying on Everest, as I recall, a uh, map, a National Geographic map about Lion Prides, it was objective, it was mannered, and it was complex, as was this one. It's hard to show 3D and 2D here, but down here we have a Putin, <laughs> pejorative Putin map, definitely biased and uh, you know propagandist, etc. It is definitely styled, because it's got Putin as an octopus, how awesome is that? And it's simple, there's really very little data on there, it's Putin as an octopus over, you know, greater Russia. So we can start placing maps in these and then start critiquing, you know, how effective they are. And really what, what I'm excited about, I guess, is that we can compare the New Yorker cover in this. We can compare persuasive maps in this, Nazi maps, you know, you know Soviet propaganda maps. We can compare bathymetry maps. It doesn't matter because all maps have form. And it's a, so this is the most exciting thing to me. And it really helps us kind of create a, a schema scheme for analyzing map aesthetic. So the takeaways, basically film and literature studies adapting these concepts and theories I really think provide us a framework for addressing aesthetic and style in a non-anecdotal ma manner or at least in a more ordinal ranking fashion <clears throat> than might otherwise be done. And it's really helping us think about new ways of critiquing maps based on their eloquence on how well their form uh, creates, allows map readers to create certain meanings. And that's what film critics do. I mean, that's one reason I love reading The New Yorker, is for their film uh, critiques. And that's what's really neat about those critiques, is they don't just talk about the content in the film or the style of the film. They, they break it down by meaning, and they, they're talking about how well it all ties together. And I think this is a new approach for, for critiquing maps. Future directions, well, the next step, I think, is to see how well this model holds up and potentially you know, start just seeing how different maps might fall into this model and whether it's of any use in the long term. Secondly, if maps start clustering in certain areas of this model, um, the next thing to look at is map genres. Just like you have film genres, are there certain conventions, even in styled conventions, for espousing certain meetings or creating certain meanings? And then I'm really excited to keep revisiting film and literature theory. It's been really fun to read. And that's that. My throat's dry. I'm sitting in an office. My allergies are kicking in. I'm going to sign off now. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me, contact me. And uh, if anyone's interested in collaborating on some of this stuff, I'd be excited to do it. Thanks a lot. Bye.